Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Games Move broadcast. For those of you who are in Second Life, uh, we do have uh, Cajun in Second Life who is going to be monitoring the chat there. So you can ask questions of the speakers in Second Life, and uh, they'll be relayed back. Uh, we will make sure that we mention the question before we answer it, so that way uh, everyone can understand what question is being asked and answered. For those of you watching on YouTube, uh, feel free to log into YouTube and leave your comments there. We'll also be monitoring the YouTube channel throughout the presentation, and we'll be re relaying your questions in as well. So without further ado, I will go ahead and let tonight's speakers, uh, Hannah, Dr. Hannah Gerber and Dr. Sandra uh, Shamroth Abrams, and they'll be talking about what is game-based learning. So feel free to take it away, Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah and uh, talk a little bit about my involvement in game-based learning and how I got uh, interested in game-based learning. Uh, I started out uh, researching adolescent males and their video game habits and how those uh, related to English language arts uh, since I was a former high school English teacher. And from there I've uh, started to uh, do more research into ways that video games, mainly commercial off-the-shelf video games, fit into uh, English language arts instruction and have currently moved into seeing how uh, practicing teachers conceptualize video games and commercial off-the-shelf video games and English language arts instruction as well as uh, Sandra and I are doing some current research in uh, video games and library environments and how the interactions that youth have with their video gaming and library environments fits in with disciplinary literacies. And uh, I'm, I'm Sandra Abrams. Um, and like Hannah, uh, I started off by looking at adolescent males and their gaming activities, but interestingly enough, it started back in 2003 when I wanted, when I was interested in what students did outside the classroom. Again, like Hannah, Hannah and I have a lot of similarities, um, both in our experiences and in our research interests, and it's one of the reasons why um, this type of collaboration is so exciting. But the what I started looking into is what students were doing outside of school, and a recurring piece was this, you know, was, was video gaming and what they were getting from gaming, and thus began my investigation into what are students doing um, with the games, what are they learning, and what kind of other literacy practices. Uh, complement, supplement, uh, feed into the overall understandings that they were um, ge generating, you know, the, the, the knowledge trajectories, if you will. And um, so since we do have these common themes in our research, we also find that with game-based learning, there is an element outside of the game that's very important to understand. And so we were asked to provide you with some seminal reads that are important in game-based learning. And so um, on the slide, you can see some of the researchers and scholars who we feel are very important in game-based learning as it relates to the entire gaming experience, meaning the metagame and the activities beyond just gameplay. And so looking at some of the scholars uh, listed, we have um, Thomas Apperly, Sasha Barab, uh, James Paul G, Kurt Squire, and Constance Steinkohler um, as some researchers and scholars who we think would be very important to kind of familiarize yourself with uh, their research. But keeping in mind also that that there are emerging scholars in this field, um, but that that Apperly and Barab and G and Squire and Steinkohler lay some uh, foundational groundwork, if you will, that helps us to understand game space learning as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, Hannah, did you want to talk more about Apperly and? Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> We kind of wanted to give you a feel for uh, what some of these scholars do and why, and why we kind of put them in as the the relation they have to what we do. Uh, Apperly, he does a lot of research in uh, how the paratexts, which are those texts outside of the game, uh, such as the walkthroughs, uh, the machinima, kind of, in a sense, some of the the meta gaming, how that fits into uh, English language arts. Um, 
and and Barab uh, focuses on learning environments and how uh, students or the game players say in, in Quest Atlantis can uh, solve a problem and it's it's actually calls a transformational play and it's this idea that uh, through their interactions they're able to solve a problem and generate a new understanding that also leads to a, um, a specific I guess element of citizenry that's really um, important and, mm -hmm. Um, and then G's work is, we found, foundational uh, because he looks at the principles of learning and identity within gaming and how that, those kind of together kind of show us those connections that they have with literacy and literacy practices. Right. And, and Squire also um, talks about the ways that games can be used within a cl classroom context and the, the, the pedagogical potential of games mm -hmm. and um, it, their value within the actual within the classroom. And then in Stein Cooler um, has kind of she has a, a very broad a broad look um, with which she calls const constellation of literacy practices. But her main focus as of recently has moved into looking at the mismatch uh, and reading between uh, what schools say uh, proficient readers are versus what. Re readers actually are within games and so it's interesting to look at some of her recent work and also some of her former work on massive multiplayer gaming and the literacies that are afforded through uh, massive multiplayer gaming. So. so um, we think it's very important as we start to explore what is game-based learning to take a look at these ideas of game-based learning and just distinguish between video game-based learning, edutainment, and gamification as often they are confused. You know, uh, you'll have people that will gamify something and call it game-based learning or bring in edutainment and call it game-based learning or vice versa. And so we kind of, we, we know that this last week you have talked about some of the differences, so we won't spend too much time on this slide, but we did want to say uh, this is how we define game-based learning. And we do define game-based learning as using video games, whether they're serious games or commercial off-the-shelf games, and the related pair text as a frame for learning um, and the experiences and the intertextual activities that surround it. So it's more than just putting the game in the classroom, it's the actual experiences um, involved in that gameplay and the activities surrounding it. It's, it's more than just the gameplay, which is what Sandra and I s often say. So, or more than just, yeah, more than just gameplay. Um, edutainment uh, is often seen as the skill and drill, kind of like the um, worksheets almost on a computer screen that there's not a lot that's involved with the game mechanics or with the real deep immersive learning. It's, it's very much skill based. And um, Sandra, did you want to take gamification? Sure. Gamification is basically the application of game-based thinking or mechanics to a non-game environment. Um, and as Cap says, it, it, tends to take the use of the game outside of the defined space into non-virtual domains and I okay and um, as far as it's it is different from game-based learning and edutain and, and yeah, pardon me edutainment in that it's more of the structure piece whereas edutainment is actual um, it, it's actually very much related to specific academic content. Um, and as, as Hannah had said, video uh, game-based learning is very much about uh, the experience and the intertextual understandings. Um, we had a question about should the term edutainment and gamification be used with educators? And that's a good question. And I'm going to answer it with another question. Why not? <laughs> um, I think it's important that as educators we be aware of the different types of games and the different types of game structures. Um, Gamification is a big uh, topic across industries and one of them is education. Um, you think about leveling up and uh, motivation pieces as well as 
the um, the idea that there's this constant feedback, right? And I think it's really more so about how these pieces are used um, that that makes it all important. Um, as far as edutainment, yes, I think that teachers need to be aware of the difference between edutainment and game-based learning and, and, and how to make the distinction so that they can choose the appropriate text for the appropriate setting. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I would agree with Sandra too. I think that having knowledge of what's available and what's out there, it, it can only make instruction better and and keep in mind the things that we're talking about are tools and it takes a creative teacher to use tools effectively and so putting either one in the classroom it's not it's not the pin that makes the classroom it's the you know the environment and the experience that makes the classroom and so um, yeah I would definitely agree that I think that the language needs to be provided um, to teachers from pre-service all the way to in-service and professional development because I think that having knowledge of what is available both through edutainment and through gamification can allow people to see the differences and how to use both effectively if needed. Yeah. And, um, and also I, as um, as Kay has, has brought up, you know, it's a good point that both games and, and education heavily use points. I think that, uh, yeah. that there is, but there is, there is a difference between grades and points and the ways that stud, uh, the gamer can, um, can a, a, uh, advance or excel um, and un, I guess the way a student can, although they might overlap in some ways and in other ways as we see in the classroom, they're actually quite, you know, uh, disparate uh, opportunities. But that doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, so when we think about uh, game-based learning, we have to consider games and identity, behavior, and resources. G talks about three different types of identity. You have the real identity, the virtual identity, and the projective identity. Um, the, per, the real identity is, you know, yourself playing the game. The virtual identity is who you are on the screen. And the projective identity is basically that connection to the character, the feeling of responsibility, the, hey, I just got through to the next or I just got I just walked into the next room even though it was really the virtual character and it's that connection to the character that is uh, that is so important that makes it such a valuable experience and and G calls that the projective identity um, in my research I had found that very interesting behavior in the place-based virtual uh, place-based gaming environment that was related to the virtual game-based environment um, and that you have this related responsive activity that help the, help the user, in this case the student, connect to what was happening on the screen. So I think that even though, yes, we need to explore how the gamer feels about the character on the screen, we also have to look at what happens outside of the screen, what happens in the, in the place-based environment and how one interacts with other people um, in response to or in relation to what's happening on the screen. And Hannah, did you want to take metagaming and paratext? Uh, yes, yes. So, um, and the identity, or, or you can you're, you can keep going on that if you want, unless you want oh, me to. Yeah, sure, since no, you. Um, okay. Um, well, as far as um, metagaming and paratext, so basically, this this part is, I th and it's all very fascinating to to us. So don't get me wrong, but this is the part where we start looking at. Okay, how do gamers um, use outside knowledge, be it of the game or of a particular topic, to advance in the game. Um, and so metagaming involves this, I, I don't want to call it peripheral knowledge, but it is this, this um, Understanding that informs gameplay, but that's not that that uh, that comes from other texts. So it could be that uh, students research uh, what it's like, uh, research Dungeons and Dragons in order to uh, inform their Neverwinter Nights um, gameplay. That actually happened with one of uh, one of the boys in my study, and he w was creating a character and. 
he investigated what it was like to be a drow and he put on music and it was really the, and, and he tried to set up this ominous environment and it was it all informed the way he uh, created this character in Neverwinter Nights and um, it's it, it's it's actually quite powerful this multimodal um, creation of um, of a character and and connection to a character um, and paratext is actually is it's text that if you can almost imagine an arrow going in and an arrow coming out paratext would be um, fanfic fan fiction um, walkthroughs machinima basically taking game-based information, right, and applying it to um, a related setting. So I know how yeah, to talk I, I more will. about um, that. I'll right. go ahead um, when it's, uh, I guess, the, ne the next slide. There we go. Uh, this actually very f much fits into the idea of metagaming and paratext into this idea of intertextual meaning making um, that occurs within game environments. And this has a strong connection also with what Sandra will be talking about in a minute with cross-disciplinary connections. But with metagaming and paratext, you get this idea that students are they are taking multiple elements that you might see in an English language arts classroom. You might, you know, involve the reading and the writing, listening, speaking, and they're producing new texts overlaying with their, their identity as Sandra was discussing. I talk with my hands, sorry. Sandra is talking about previously and coming up with uh, new innovative texts, which which are definitely a part of the idea of the metagame and the paratext, the fan fiction, the machinima, the walkthroughs, and the game reviews. And so what, what we see with youth who are engaging in these types of activities is a much a layered literacy practice. And they're engaging in literacy activities um, let me think of the right word to, to say. They're, they're engaging in literacy practices at at a much more nuanced but yet broad perspective. So you see this idea of, let's say, a student um, taking, playing a video game, as Sandra was explaining, but they're not just playing the game, they're also attaching themselves to writing about the game and to reading about the game. and picking up from that, they're then collaborating with others to kind of make meaning and use their identities throughout. Um, so, Sandra, anything? Or, yeah. Yeah, actually, um, one of the things that I love to do with my students is we look at machinima and we consider, okay, well, what is it from a writing point of view and, and let's say, the creation of an argument, right? What is it that we want our students to do? We want them to uh, formulate a uh, an argument that is supported by um, by uh, by facts that shows both sides. And obviously, not <laughs> nothing is created equally, right? So not all machinima is created equally. But what's really cool is that sometimes machinima is uh, uh, people can use machinima to tell a story or to prove a point to create an argument and um, it's it's extraordinarily uh, satisfying as as an educator as a researcher as a gamer to see uh, people use this platform um, as a way to, uh, to, to, to not even I, I would say develop those skills but they to um, also hone those skills and I yeah. think that as educators we need to be more aware of ways that students are representing their um, their ideas and developing their um, their writing skills their argument skills their mm -hmm. um, or should I, argument based skills um, through various modalities and 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 how, interestingly enough, they build upon their game-based knowledge and their um, their connection to the game, their connection to the characters, to to move it and move it forward into a new domain, so to say. And and I actually I'll, I'll jump in there also on machinima, um, and this is just this is just my opinion, but also coming from you know some anecdotal uh, evidence, I would say that I have um, is that. I think machinima is probably one of the 
easiest ways, and like I said, it's just my opinion, of bringing gaming into your classroom and introducing the concepts of teaching through gaming because you do get the idea of the game. You get to see the action, but you, your, your students can either analyze it, as Sandra said, or they can create it. And it's, mm -hmm. it's one of those things that I think as a teacher, it's, it's great to have in your, your toolbox is knowledge of machinima and what it is because as Sandra is saying, it, it can go both ways. It can be analyzed or it can be created. And there are multiple other ways to use it. Um, you're as creative as you can be. It's remember the teacher's creativity is what makes the classroom. And, um, the, it's it's very simple to you know do YouTube searches uh, this summer in, in a workshop I taught um, machinima was out of 150 teachers it, I would say it was about 70 this is why I said it's I haven't don't have the exact number but it was about 75 percent of the teachers based upon the evaluations that thought machinima was the most exciting part of bringing video games into the classroom the easiest to do because it's yeah. it's you know you don't have to have the consoles you don't have to have um, you know all of the materials and students also appreciate it because they can then bring in their experiences their knowledge of the game and for many who feel uncomfortable presenting or sharing even someone who might be a little more shy um, there's this opportunity to have a voice through another medium and uh, and, and that that's a very powerful uh, a powerful piece um, but something also to remember is that or to keep in mind I should say is that just because a student is a gamer doesn't mean that he or she would be familiar with all games mm -hmm. and I think it's important to consider what game uh, how you're going to use as, as Hannah said how you're going to use the machinima in your classroom that it is the teacher who makes it but who who makes it it's not the machinima that makes it it's really and actually it's the combination of the student mm -hmm. the teacher and the machinima right mm -hmm. but it has to make sense for everybody um, we have a question that came in on how do uh, how do kids get instructions on machinima without taking away from the curriculum? Um, if I'm understanding uh, this correctly, I, I would kind of assume the way that you might structure your classroom, this would be uh, something that I would probably do, would be to have workshops. And you've got, if you do have uh, machinima, if you, let's say that your classroom is set up and you've got common topics or common things that you are discussing, you could have a certain part of your workshop area or your classroom set up for machinima creation and within that area of the classroom, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping I understand the question correctly, but within that part of the classroom there could be uh, videos and walkthroughs that you have for students to watch to learn how to create machinima um, so that you're not actually doing the whole class. I, I'm very big on uh, individual um, learning and uh, workshop based learning so instead of telling the entire class they have to do this you kind of give students options and so if you wanted students to have instructions on machinima Personally, that's probably how I would set up a classroom where you've got workshops and stations. And if a student is choosing to do machinima, they have the little videos there and the information on how to create machinima. Because machinima may not be something that a student necessarily wants to create. They might want to write fan fiction. And you could still do an assessment for creative writing using both means, um, which I believe you'll be talking about assessment later in your uh, MOOC. So, Sandra? Okay, um, we have another question, and I think that Hannah and I can both uh, speak to it, um, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll just I'll read it aloud. What kind of machinima do you use? Walkthroughs, kids, professionals, game guides? Um, it really depends on what the, uh, the, end, the, the, the end game is, um, mm -hmm. meaning what are we trying to do? So um, something as simple as... Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is a pun. Um, <laughs> um, so something as simple as a, um, I, I mean, I, I've seen kind of a hybrid machinima um, walkthrough where people will provide um, information about a game, right, how to get through, you know, most traditional walkthroughs um, kind of tell you, like, how to get through uh, the, the game itself. But I've seen... Um, students reproduce or gamers reproduce their uh, their gameplay and actually provide a video walkthrough but at the same time 
um, also create a story along with it. So there's kind of this hybrid piece. And that's actually one of my favorite ones to show my students because um, it, it really um, exemplifies the the vast potential of machinima and how um, I think that we have to be mindful that the beauty of this type of technology and um, or I guess the use of the technology is that we can do a lot with it and um, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, restricted to the way it is defined on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah and um, I'll, I'll jump in here too. I, I think that's what is so fascinating about about machinima and kind of goes back to a little bit about what I was talking about before. I have seen some interesting, uh, you know, from even the professional studios who have created it. It's very, it's a very broad topic. Um, there's, there's one that's interesting that you could even Google it. It's a, it's a Pac-Man one, and it's, um, it's, it's like a feature film, and it's fascinating. So just because they're not actually using entire screen captures from the um, video game, they're taking this idea and extrapolating this character, Pac-Man, and creating this whole story out of it that is done almost as a feature film, and it's in a professional studio, and it, it can be used in your classroom but then you've got very much run-of-the-mill kind of let's put it together in a couple of minutes and I think that's where your students can begin to analyze you know the differences you, you can take something that maybe isn't done in a professional studio but still has a wonderful storyline great transitions and your students can analyze that hey this is still a great piece of of work a great piece of art even though it wasn't done you know with this huge budget and so I think you could have kind of do comparisons as to what makes machinima good what makes it effective um, you could you could have them compare um, and this goes into some other work that I've done where you take a look at expository creative persuasive and machinima can be done in all those ways and so to kind of answer the question um, is uh, let me review the question again yeah the type of machini machinima you use I think it goes back to what Sandra is saying and, and what what are the uh, goals that you're trying to achieve because machinima and that's why I think machinima is so powerful is you can teach about creative you can teach about a creative writing or creative production expository persuasive because that can all be done through uh, machinima and um, also, as, as Hannah had said, in regards to the different types, you know, and I know exactly the Pac-Man one is, is amazing, um, but it is also important, as Hannah said, to bring in the, uh, the, the ones that, that the child, you know, that kids make, mm -hmm. so because it shows that how they use the game, that their manipulation of the game player, um, the game characters, I'm sorry, can tell the story as well, and then you bring into um, into account, you know, gesture. You bring into um, positioning. You bring into account the environment and, and how the characters on the screen are interacting. And I think that that's also very powerful um, because it adds a whole other element to to the understanding and analysis of meaning making. It's it, it's it's actually um, it, it's it's quite complex when you think about it. Um, we had a question. Yeah. About did you did you want to talk more about machinima or do you want me to? Um, no, I was I was actually I can try to address this question. I'm not I'm not sure if I if uh, it says do students or gamers deal with projective identity and is that good or bad or both? Um, and I, I'm I'm guessing that if you were to say that a, a student is a gamer and um, I, I think the projective identity is a given um, because if you're familiar with, uh, you might not be, uh, but you might be with a uh, transactional theory and and reading or, or literature, which is that meaning is made in this transaction between the reader, the text, and the uh, transaction that between you know the social experiences, etc. Um, and so I think it's actually think looking at projective identity, there is research that says you know game games don't make gamers bad it's 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 um you know the research on violence and violence in video games and i'm 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 not sure if this is what the question has is is asking but i think it might be so that's kind of why i'm addressing this um Violent video games don't make violent kids is what the research says however if a game if a child is predisposed to violence 
then that will bring it out in the kids. Same as they have pro-social gaming where kids and people are asked to do things that are good and they research shows there's uh, at the Pew Internet um, Association has research that shows that gamers increase in civic engagement when they're immersed in certain types of pro-social gaming and so I, I don't know but the projective identity does play into both of those because it's the experiences that kind of are transactions so you know I don't know if that addresses the question Sandra do you want to jump in I'm not sure if I understand yeah. the question the right well, you know, I'm not sure if I, I understand the question as far as, um, I'm not sure what it means to deal with the projective identity. Um, I think that the the whole piece about the projective identity is that connection to the character and that immersion in the game um, is very much related to the projective identity. And um, I think that they... Um, Okay. And, and as far as character attachment issues or the character connection, I think that there's something very special about feeling connected to the character. And I do understand, you know, that there has absolutely there has been literature about you know game addiction and whatnot. Um, but I also think this is really what it comes down to in my in my mind, right? Anything in excess. Is could you know is is not always the best for you, right? So, and I know gamers are like what, but you have too much water, and and all of a sudden you you know you you're not able to yeah. right, hyponatremia. Right, exactly, hyponatremia. <laughs> I was gonna say you flush out all your your nutrients, um, and you know, but that the healthy amount of gaming that's up to I think is is individualized. We all have different healthy amounts of gaming. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the projective identity is, I think, the key piece. Um, as far as dealing with, I think it just is. I think you feel connected to your character for a reason, be it because all of a sudden uh, one is able to feel more competent in doing something. I remember I had a student saying how um, he uh, liked doing a, a certain um, sport online um, that he couldn't do. Uh, in real life, but he was always excited to play the game because that he was able to to accomplish something. Um, in fact, I've heard that you know countless times, and that kind of connection again is powerful. And and I think that it's I, I don't necessarily know it. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. if that does that answer the question? I, I think so. And I'll jump in there. I think I I saw some clarif yeah clarification that the connection to the character. So yeah. uh, Sandra was kind of uh, discussing that. And I I think I think it depends. You know on the the depth of the connection. If you lose yourself completely, you're no longer a projective identity. You're you're a lost character. So it's it's the projective identity is a little bit of of both. You you can't um, you can't not have any of yourself left and not have any you have it, it's it's emerging of both um, and I think from personal experience I know that I've I've made connections with characters and games uh, it sounds really weird but you make connections with characters and books and it's I think it's important to to realize that you do the deep connection that uh, is developed through gaming and the characters and the affinities in the game as actually what helps lend itself to some of what we were talking before, those intertextual meaning makings. Because if it's a completely flat character in a game that a student doesn't connect with and doesn't develop, um, you, they will develop a productive identity of a sorts. But but I, I think that it's important. I don't think it's necessarily a, a bad thing. So Okay. Okay, yeah, I was just waiting for the screen oh. to change. Um, okay, so um, when we think about game-based learning and um, cross-disciplinary cross -disciplinary connections, we have to remember that it's not necessarily, necessarily re relegated to the console. What's important, and I think we've already touched upon this, is that you could bring in um, games-based learning, uh, you can incorporate into your classroom in a number of ways without having to have the Xbox. Um, you can bring in uh, examples of machinima, um, what paratexts, um, 
sorry, and other paratext, but it's also um, what are the other, it, what, it really comes down to what are the experiences, what are the students' experiences that you can capitalize on and um, draw upon on, uh, draw upon in the classroom. So when we talk about the confluence of activities and modalities, we're really looking at ways that you can um, pretty much integrate the traditional and the contemporary. You know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. The idea is that there's a time and a place for games and for game experiences. Um, and it has to make sense. I just was talking about this the other night with my students in um, one of my classes is that it's the how we use games in the classroom, not the fact that we are using games in the classroom. It's how, it's the connections that we're, we're making and it's how we are using it to further um, understand a specific or multiple um, topics or a material or to help students solve a problem. Like whatever the purpose is, it has to be related to that. Just to have students play games and say, oh, they're learning. Sure, but how is it related? You you know what I'm saying? It 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 um it, it really needs to to make sense in the classroom. Um and as far as looking at ways that students build upon their their understandings of the game um uh, or game activities, I'm going to actually read a um an, a, a vignette that uh, Hannah and I, along with Melissa Burgess, have um, a chapter in uh, New Media Literacies and Particip Participatory Popular um, Culture, um, and it's called Digital Worlds and Shifting Borders. So this is Robbie, one of my one of the students I had interviewed, and he says, "I usually try to invade this one territory of Austria. I don't remember its name." And usually they have a huge army that makes me fail. So when I listen to the podcast, they say that he, meaning Napoleon, did not invade there. So when I play Rise of Nations, I try to follow what happened in real life up until the point where he failed in real life. So I alter the plans. And basically, Robbie was able to un use his knowledge of the game right where the the constraints of the game as well and also his knowledge of Napoleon and history to be able to make uh, to, be, to be able to to uh, win to be able to um, be successful and so when we think about games based learning it, it's that experience that's so important and it's also you think about what else Robbie was doing he was listening to podcasts um, it, he doesn't in, in this particular vignette he doesn't it doesn't come out but he was also he was reading books he was um, going on various online um, forums to learn about so you have all these uh, multimodal and and um, very interactive um, and learning experiences informing his gameplay and you can bring that into your classroom it without again without having to have a console and the strange thing is not one of Robbie's uh, teachers knew about any of this mm -hmm. um, about his his gaming um, and the way that it informed his understanding of uh, in this case of, of history and how his understanding of history informed his gameplay mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, other ways to bring in um, experiences, I think you all have to know what your students are playing, what they are doing, um, and and try to figure out how it is that you want to uh, integrate the gameplay. And and my my suggestion is to let students have a lot of opportunities to create their own as opposed to fitting it into a particular genre or, or limiting it to a particular genre um, because then that really opens up and allows uh, students to um, to draw upon what they feel most comfortable with. And, and I'll add to that too, and I'll also read an excerpt uh, from the same chapter. Um, I think one thing that we have to also keep in mind too is with cross-disciplinary connections, we should allow students to not only draw upon their knowledge across 
uh, curriculum, but also bounce off of one another, which we'll talk about also as uh, some of the uh, digital literacies that occur, but that, that idea of collaboration and, and learning from one another and making meaning together across subject areas. And so um, I'm going to read a short ex excerpt from uh, the chapter on Davis, who is a participant in one of my studies uh, in his English language arts class. And yeah, he was writing a story or a novel, but not for class. As Sandra's participants, he was writing a novel outside of class collaboratively based upon um, a character in his video game, but he needed knowledge that he didn't have, so he relied upon a classmate. And here's the uh, quote, direct quote from, from Davis. Like, the best thing about Gary was that he was planning on writing a story about something that he didn't quite understand, but which I did, which was sci-fi. So I gave him some ideas on that and what would work and the weapon systems that would work based upon the knowledge of weapons from the games I'm playing. And he had this idea to set my story in the middle of the Crusades, of which he had knowledge given uh, his knowledge of biblical history. So we researched it and found a period of 30 years not in the history books, which gave me complete control over what happened to my characters in my story. And so he, at that time, was playing, a, you know, a fantasy story or a fantasy video game, uh, Morrowind. And um, anyway, he started to write the story, and he needed some help, and he relied on a classmate who he knew had extensive historical experience to trade off information on science fiction to help Gary with his story. So it's kind of this negotiation and uh, helping of one another in kind of a cross-disciplinary uh, um type of, of learning as well. But it, it goes also, can go beyond uh, the story writing also into science and math. And like Sandra said, it just depends on the context and how are you, how are you using it and, and not just bring it in games because they're cool, but bring them in because they actually have some edu educational implications in your classroom um, rather than just being cool. Because the important thing is how you use the tool, not that you have the tool. Right. right. And, and, Hannah and Hannah also, also uh, um, you know, you know, the collaboration, the collaboration that, Hannah that Hannah was referring to, referring to is, is so key, so key in gaining key, 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 and, and, you know, into, into an education. education. And, and one of the things, things that I'm always, I'm always amazed, amazed about is, about is the, when the, I go into the classroom with my students, with my students in the high school, high school or a high school, 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 sometimes they're always so surprised when, when it can be noisy. We have, have a whole discussion, discussion about, about um, constructive, and I, I mean, I, I mean, I play, play around with it, constructive versus destructive, versus destructive noise. noise. Uh, yeah, um, as I was going to say, um, oh, okay. on, on that, um, on that note, the, the idea is kind of uh, tying in with what Sandra was saying is that, um, it is it is important to understand absolutely the the con the concepts um, involved in um, the context. So, um, so then uh, next slide that we have has to do with. Um, some of the constraints in conducting research, and this is coming from our. Um, most recent research that we have um, we have both conducted and it's very interesting that's what we were talking about earlier how our uh, research has a lot of overlaps and so often we'll, we will conduct studies and then we'll come back and we'll talk to one another and we'll be like wow I had the same findings which really lends itself to the fact that the research is, that we're doing is is pretty much spot on and um, what we've kind of found is that there are several things that we need to watch for when we start to implement um, game-based learning in the classroom. And um, anyway, uh, Sandra, did you want to start off on the some of the sure. things? Sure. Can can you hear me better now? Or is there still a lot of reverb? Yeah, it's good. I can hear. It's better. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, well. I think actually this would be a great time to to build upon that. You we have obviously you have technological constraints, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, what's interesting is that Hannah and I um, had have found that um, one that teachers don't always feel so comfortable using technology and and or they feel comfortable using certain technologies. And just to kind of um, build upon that, you know, when I use games in my classroom. Just because people game doesn't mean that they feel comfortable with every game. Mm -hmm. And that's something to think about. Um, and sometimes they don't want to, sometimes 
the students don't want to uh, fail in front of others. When I say fail, they don't want to, you know, not do well on the screen because that could affect, you know, how they appear to others. So that that's also a very important thing to remember if you do bring games in is, you know, just because someone is competent in one game doesn't necessarily mean a that they're competent in another, and or that they're going to feel comfortable playing in front of others. Whereas I'm sure that there'll be, you know, some students who are, you know, no pun intended or pun intended, game to play. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, but as far as some some other constraints, so you know, you got you have standardized testing. You have that, um, you know, this idea of needing to um, teach to the test or to make sure that students can uh, know the material for the test. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's certainly been touched upon in quite a bit of literature. And the idea is that we can use games to enhance what's happening in the classroom, but the teachers are feeling, well, oh my goodness, well, what do you mean? I, how am I going to fit that in? Or that they feel um, that there's so many other uh, what, um, you know, initiative fatigue, right? They feel that there's so many other things going on that, you know, how would something that they want to, one, either they're tired and they don't want to necessarily bring in something else, or if they do want to initiate something, how does it fit in within the, the uh, existing curriculum? Um, and then, you know, you have the financial constraints. Where do, where do the people get, where do the schools get the money? And when they do have technologies, a, a technology, What's working? You know, just because you have a laptop doesn't mean that when you press the keys that every single letter, you know, it, that the keys work. It doesn't necessarily mean that internet is up. Uh, just finished interviewing some teachers that, who talked about how, um, you know, at least once a month they have a sign on their door that says the internet's down. So w we do need to be flexible, especially when we think about how we're going to use technology. Um, at games in the classroom and um, I always have like a plan B and just as a quick side story that's related to this in one of my classes um, my math my students who are math ed majors wanted to use um, a video of, um, of Mario Brothers and to teach slope and as it turned out the internet was down um, actually no I'm sorry the school that we went into there was no internet connection in the, in the, in the particular classroom. Um, it was only um, relegated to the computer lab. And so my students ended up using a screenshot and it was still so effective. So I think we need to be creative and think about, okay, despite these constraints, what else can we do? And I know we're still talking about constraints, but as we do, it, just keep in mind, it doesn't mean that we can't use games or that it's going to prevent us. It just means that we have to always have a plan B and usually a plan C and be creative. Um, and, and collaborate with other, others and think about how um, it, we, we can make it work either within our classroom, across class, class, classrooms, and across <laughs> content areas. Um, did you want to talk some? Yeah, um, and, and related to the idea of um, the collegial support, one, one of the findings I have some of, some of my recent research that I've, I've uh, conducted on teachers uh, who actually implemented uh, this uh, study where I had teachers play video games, kind of what you're doing through to completion, and then determine the likelihood and the ability to be able to implement in the classroom. And one of the, the major findings that I found in the study is that there's this, the apprehension, some of it comes from the financial constraints and some of it comes from the actual, you know, infrastructure constraints. But one of the biggest fears is the, this kind of idea of the panopticon of, of uh, surveillance and power. Like, what are my colleagues going to think of me when I implement these games in my classroom? Will I still be seen as a, as a valid teacher if I'm bringing in something like um, video games in the classroom? And... Uh, above and beyond, e even though the, these findings did come out in this study, the teachers still, there's this desire to engage in it. Um, you know, I think one of my favorite favorite sit quotes or favorite sayings one of the teachers said was, come on, who's ever really going to run around all day fighting baddies and collecting bananas? And that kind of goes hand in hand with this idea that um, bringing games into the classroom is kind of scary. And it, it, it does have this 
this idea that if you bring it into your classroom, you may not be perceived as a um, as a serious teacher by your colleagues. But out of the 150 plus teachers that took part in a study that I conducted later, the majority of them began to see that, wait a second, once I understand it, I realize that this can really be used for serious learning. And so having that kind of overcoming that fear and realizing that, well, if I explain, you know, if you do want to bring games into your classroom, be prepared with rationales to explain why and how, because then you can be seen and what you're doing can be seen as valid rather than I'm just bringing it in for fun. Have those serious rationales because then that idea of surveillance and, and being seen as a, a serious teacher, that it becomes a moot point uh, because you've got your serious rationales for why you're doing what you're doing. And as far as rationale goes, I mean, I, I, the Common Core doesn't have any particular um, points about technology except that it should be integrated into all of the <laughs> all of the other standards, um, and so you know, if you can think about how you're going to, if if, if that's how your school um, frames the discussion of um, or frames pedagogy or frames practice, then think about how you can fit games into it without necessarily. Um, making games too much about assessment because we also have to remember that we don't want, this is a um, this is something that students love and students enjoy and you'll get a lot more out of them if you continue to allow them to enjoy it rather than making it um, about an assessment you know assessing it to, to death, to death. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's um, it actually goes hand in hand with the what, 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 uh, with what we're about to talk about um, and, and that is the one thing I think we do need to remember is that this is something that is very very much a part of students um, uh, entertainment and engagement outside of school uh, but at that same point in time we don't want to dichotomize in school and out of school learning we, we do want to find those seamless areas where they overlap and without as Sandra saying assessing um, to death what we're doing, or, or I like to call rubricide, um, you know, <laughs> we, we do need to be very careful about about um, killing off the joy of something. But with that in mind, there are some very important digital literacies that do emerge in gaming environments that you can come up with ways to uh, create engaging learning experiences in your classroom. Um, and and th these are are kind of across the board. You don't have to use video games to do this. I mean, you don't have to have a lot of technology, but these are very important attributes that citizens, students will need in a global society. And they're, inv they're involved in gaming and they're all part of a, a gaming environment, all of these. Um, you know, collective intelligence, when we think of a collective intelligence, we think about, you know, more minds together are smarter than, than you know, one mind. You have uh, Wikipedia, which is a prime example um, of of collective intelligence. Um, I I think it might be G that says um, uh, the greatest. I'm trying to think of how he says it. He says something about Sandra. Do you know the quote I'm thinking of that he says with collective intelligence? Something about collective intelligence is a mind that's greater than all the minds in the room, or something like that. I mean, it's it's um, the idea of of multiple people coming together in a guild and and using their skills which kind of goes into some of the collaborative inquiry but using their skills and their smarts together to solve problems um, appropriation is taking existing material and making it your own uh, collaborative inquiry I know we're on a time limit so I'm going quickly collaborative inquiry is um, together finding posing problems and then learning to solve them together so it does tie in with collective intelligence uh, connectivist learning oh, is what we're no, doing go ahead, right go ahead. Oh, yeah, it, exactly it is what yeah, we're doing it's now. what we're doing right now the uh, MOOC that we're in is very much connectivist learning where multiple go ahead Sandra no go ahead go oh. <laughs> um, I'll let you jump in Did, oh, it look like basically you to... no no no, no. I, oh. basically you were you were doing fine go ahead okay okay um, and then mobility is it's kind of uh, one thing that comes recently is the idea of multi-screen learning or being able to learn on the go and that the experience is different um, on any device that you are on but you still get a, a rich learning uh, experience the mobility in it and go ahead yeah oh 
And then electricy, which is um, this concept that digital literacy is not the right term to use for um, what, um, let's see, electricity is basically saying that digital literacy does not encompass what we're doing just like literacy did not uh, replace orality. Uh, digital literacy cannot replace literacy. You need a whole new kind of frame and term. And so electricity, it comes into this idea that play and the internet are the new way that we make meaning, where in a liter literate culture, it's print and um, knowledge acquisition. In an oral culture, it was simply the ability to listen and, and understand. And so kind of it's this idea that electricity is that we can't use the word literacy to replace, uh, we can't use digital literacy to replace literacy. Literacy is not being replaced. There's just a changing face to how it is. So it's uh, being a part of an electorate, env electorate environment. And likewise, you know, learning is not necessarily being replaced, but as a, but rather, um, you know, you have this, uh, the, a new understanding of how we come to, um, how we build knowledge trajectories, right? So you have people, um, you have multi-based knowledge sources. You have people being able to go online and, and hear from other people. And it's exactly what Hannah said. You know, this MOOC is an example of connectivist learning. Um, but we are in, I, I think we have to face the fact that we are in the age of connectivism. We are, um, we have at our fingertips, so or most most have at their fingertips, right? This ability to find information and to hear different perspectives, um, and that that's really powerful because when you think about a textbook, it's real. It's written from one perspective, or traditional textbooks. Let me let me clarify that. But now you can hear from other people. You have peer interaction, peer review. Um, so it's. It, 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 the teacher as authority is really more the teacher's facil facilitator, and that's very powerful because there's this, you know, quasi-autonomous but certainly very agentive learning going on. And um, as far as you know, gaming and in the classroom, you certainly can call upon those pieces um, to to help you rationalize your use of games-based learning. Absolutely. I think that, yeah. Yeah, I think that's. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. This is Kay. I'm just jumping in real quickly because <laughs> we because we're ending really soon. So, so some last questions for you. The first one, and um, we will send this out everywhere. Um, but they want to know what are your Twitter accounts and what blogs. So if you could say those, we will put them in text. But if you just let people yeah. know that, that'd be great. Um, yes, uh, my my Twitter handle or my Twitter my Twitter <laughs> my Twitter name is the Right Gamer, and right as in um, like writing, like you're writing. So T H E W R I T E G A M E R, the Right Gamer, and. Um, the website that goes along with that too is just therightgamer.com and there's a blog link on there so um, and also forums if you want to discuss anything there are also forums and uh, my website is uh, www.learn411.com so like learn information um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's um, it's always under construction, um, but uh, certainly am. Uh, I'm pretty. Sure, I, I I haven't. Um, I think I do have a forum um, that is that you can access through there. And if not, then there will be one very soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is perpetual beta business. It is perpetual beta for sure. Yes, always. Okay, then I will end it now, um, and I just have to say thank you so much. One of the comments that we got were, they are both well-versed and passionate about the subject. Great for speakers for the MOOC. So thank you so much for being our intro to game-based yeah. learning um, MOOC speakers, and we will be blasting this um, broadcast out to a lot of places because it was absolutely wonderful, and thank you guys so much. Thank you. It was Thank you. our pleasure. Thank you.